welcome to Christy Wuchuku's Brilliance TV show. I am so excited. Today's topic, I'm being joined by my friend, Deborah Willett Wilson. Deborah Chillett Wilson. I hope I don't mess your name up. But anyhow, <laughs> I am so super excited to be joined by Deborah today. Now, and if you're watching this for the very first time, this is where we spotlight top today's top business. I can't get the word out. Today's top <laughs> business leaders, entrepreneurs, unique and most successful individuals. And today we're going to be talking on the topic of owning your brilliance, pathway to success. Now, let me tell you about the person that is joining me today. Deborah is a licensed counselor, professional licensed counselor. She's a coach, a trainer, and she's going to be sharing with us about self-care. So take it away, Deborah. Well, hi, Christy. I'm really glad to be here this evening and to be able to share things with everyone. And um, I guess to get started a little bit about myself, um, like you said, I'm a licensed professional counselor here in the state of Texas, and I've specialized in trauma treatment for children uh, and adults. Uh, I also do have a coaching program, and uh, I've authored books and uh, do a lot of different things. So I have a, instead of a busy life these days, I have a very full life, and that's a big difference in in I think my shift into just going through the motions of life and being more su really successful. Thank you very much. You and I met, uh, what is it, at Las Vegas back in July. Mm -hmm. We've actually been talking over the phone, but we haven't actually met because you live in, where, where do you live? I live in uh, Winsboro, Texas, which is you North live in Texas, Texas. And I live in California. So we've right. been talking and connecting through uh, public speakers association and but we haven't actually physically met until the conference in Las Vegas in July so and yeah. we have been connecting ever since so thank you for joining me so um, thank you I understand me. you wrote a book Sanctuary yeah. Found can you tell us a little bit about that book um, the book Sanctuary Found is a novel about a woman's uh, struggle and triumph over childhood sexual abuse and domestic violence. And uh, I threw in a little murder mystery in the process of it just to make it more entertaining and interesting. Okay. But it was, uh, it was a labor of love where I wanted to showcase the challenges that women face in dealing with these issues and, and how they can overcome them when they have the right support and help. Okay, I'm going to piggyback on what you just talked about. And uh, I know that in every successful entrepreneur, every successful person, there's always a journey behind the success. And oftentimes we get to hear about the success, but oftentimes I've always said that it is through the journey that we get to learn the lessons so that we don't make the same mistake again. So tell us how it all began for you. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I would say that my journey has not been a straight line to success. It's been uh, a few steps forward, a few steps backward, a few circles, <laughs> squares, <laughs> triangles. <laughs> and um, so um, I, I've had my own challenges uh, dealing with, you know, issues in my life from childhood and in an early marriage. Um, also in the workforce, uh, being a female uh, had its challenges as well uh, because I was kind of defined as to what I was capable of doing and, and uh, kind of tried to be fenced in, which doesn't work for me because <laughs> I don't like being fenced in. Um, you know, I've had, um, in my journey, I've had a lot of ups and downs as far as it's kind of like, I listen to my intu intuition and then I don't. And when I do listen to it, things work well <laughs> and I make progress. And when I don't listen to it, things fall apart. So I've kind of had this journey of learning through the school of hard knocks because I wouldn't pay attention. 
<laughs> to my intuition always when it when it spoke to me. And so over the years, um, uh, I've had lots of learnings from from doing you know doing that. About six years ago, I would say I had a big transition, a big transformation when I realized that kind of through my hard knocks, I had really become very depleted and in my spirit and in my, in my body. And even though I loved what I was doing, it was like, it, I wasn't getting nurtured. And that's where self care comes in because I wasn't self caring. Um, I wasn't, uh, I was so focused on doing, 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 you know, being that human doing instead of connecting to the being that I am and asking myself, is this what I need to be doing? And so in that experience one day when I was sitting here in my office, I realized how tired I felt and that I was becoming basically resentful and angry about how life was turning out for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect to be at that place when I turned 60. And so uh, that was like a wake up call for me because that was not on my agenda of how I wanted to grow as a human being in, into becoming that way. And so that was my journey on learning how to self care about myself and learning how to embrace everything that's happened to me. I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. And out of doing that, one of the things I realized was that, you know, as a, I, and I think this is true for a lot of women, we, we don't have any problem looking at the bad and the ugly. We can tell everybody about that. But when it comes to the good things that we've done in our lives, we really don't focus on those very much. And so one of the things, you know, sometimes your own words come back to haunt you. <laughs> And so I rem I've said for years, what you focus on is where your energy goes. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, out of my own mouth, I realized I had not been focusing on all of the, the good things that I'd done in my life and, uh, and the things that were valuable to me, the, the challenges that I'd overcome and survived. I really didn't pay much attention to those. So I began to pull out things that I had kept from different experiences that I had. One that was significant was when I was a firefighter because that really pushed me and challenged me in ways that I didn't know I could do. And I did all those things. So I pulled out my memorabilia and put it up in my office and began to start appreciating what I, that I had done those things. It wasn't anybody else. I had done all that and I wasn't giving myself credit for it. And even further back when I was a Girl Scout, I didn't pay attention to any of that. So I pulled those things out and began to look, you know, began to look at the good things that I'd done in my life, how I had, you know, triumphed over difficulties and challenges. And then I, you know, complained about other people not acknowledging me. Well, I wasn't acknowledging myself. And as I began to, to do that, my a new journey began. That's kind of led me to where I am today. Thank you. I am going to go ahead and piggyback on what you just talked about. Um, because we live in an era right now where, you know, I think we've all given ourselves permission to be able to talk about what life was before we got to where we were. Like I said, oftentimes you hear about the successes, but really it is through those times that you are, that we are in the valley that people learn the most. At least that's what I believe. Mm -hmm. So you talked about, um, and I think you referred to it, glass ceiling. And that was in the days that women were, weren't allowed to do certain things or uh, oftentimes even in a corporate world um there's certain positions that women cannot do but i think that things have changed now because as we know in most positions even in corporate uh, are being held by women depending on whether you work for government or whether you work for um, private industry but i think overall i think things have really changed and so 
for the people that are coming on the millennials right now, they mm -hmm. really have nothing to hold them back as far as going after what they desire in life. So what in your, when we talk about moving from J-O-B, which of course I still have my J-O-B with a plan of um, mm -hmm. fully transitioning. When we talk about that, what do you think are the challenges that most women face right now? Well, from, you know, working with the clients that I work with, which are women, there's, of course, childcare is a big issue for them and, and not really having enough income sometimes to support themselves. Uh, and especially if they're having to be a single mom. Uh, so those are some of the challenges that, that women face. And if they get sick, then, you know, who's going to take care of the kids and who's, who's going to help them? Um, also, you know, I've worked with children over the years, too, and, you know, there isn't, I guess we're kind of losing in this new age that we're in, uh, community. And, of course, especially I live out in a rural area, so people are spread out all over, all over the place. And you, you have to kind of deliberately create your own community because, you know, there's so much distance between each other. But I, I find that, you know, sometimes people stay isolated because they're too afraid to reach out. And I think for women, uh, we've, been, we've become what I call the lone rangerettes. We just try to dig in and do whatever needs to be done. We get back into that doing, 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 and we don't pause enough to think about, well, maybe I could ask someone for help. So I think for women, uh, sometimes feeling isolated and feeling like they have to do everything. And if they reach out to other women, then somehow that's going to make them look like they're not doing a good enough job, which I don't agree with that. But I, that's what I find in a lot of my clients. And, you know, I think just kind of keeping up with whatever, you know, job or industry you're in, just trying to keep up with all the changes, I think is really stressful for everyone. And, um, and so that adds some, some challenges to life as well. Thank you. You know, I totally agree because I think um, in this era that we live now, what is, one of the greatest things that I have really come to appreciate is that it's okay to talk about your challenges without thinking about other people or what other people are going to say. And I think oftentimes as women, it's really, uh, we find it very difficult. We will be appreciating other people, but when we talk about appreciating ourselves or talking about the challenges that we're going through, it's very difficult. And I'm glad to know that um, things have come to change, that people know that um, if you have a challenge, most likely someone else has the same challenge. And if mm -hmm. you can share the journey, if you can share what you have been through, perhaps you're going to save someone else from going through the same thing and not being so worried about what other people are going to be, um, are going to say. So I think that things have, I've seen things really change in that respect and continues to change in that respect. Oftentimes, we, it's almost like we are in this bubble or uh, women, sometimes we, it, it's, it, we think we have to compete with other women. But I think mm -hmm. there's enough abundance that if you focus on what you do best, if you collaborate, bring what you do best and allow someone else to bring back what they do best, I think we can all come out um, stronger than trying to operate um, by ourselves. So I, I totally agree on that. So what can you tell us in terms of, uh, in terms of, I mean, you talked a little bit about this, in terms of women in this day and age, how do you see, um, how do you see entrepreneurship and I, and I know that now, more than ever, women are moving into entrepreneurship. How do you see entrepreneurship and in terms of uh, women and self-care? And what, what impact will not having self-care have on 
our growth? Okay. Well, for one thing, um, I think entrepreneurship is an excellent vehicle for women because one size doesn't have to fit all. And a woman can put her own personality. She can fit it around her, you know, if she's got raising children or taking care of elderly parents, uh, you know, having a husband. She can work her schedule for building a business around everything else in her life which um, I think is really great. It's very different than having a job where, you know, you have to miss your children's, you know, school parties or you have to miss their games that they play or their concerts. Uh, you know, so because I think that really stresses women out because sometimes it's like if I'm working, well, I know for me, if I'm working here in my practice too much, then I feel like I'm, you know, not letting some other part of my life have, have any of my energy, you know, so I get pulled between feeling guilty of <laughs> where I'm at. Uh, and I think that's true for a lot of women. So I think entrepreneurship is a, one of the opportunities that women have today to find something that they can do to create their own income and, and also to per, with personal growth, because I don't see, building a business, you can really build a business unless you're personally growing and stretching yourself because it, it is a whole new world out there in entrepreneurship because I've been in it for a little while myself and I know all the things that I'm learning. And it's not, again, it's not a straight line. It's, it takes curves and, and ups and downs, but it's, it's, a, it's ex, an exciting journey because you get to really find out there's a lot more inside of you than what you really thought was there as you begin to, to learn and grow. Another thing I think for women, I think that for so long we've kind of bought into the belief about competition and we apply it to each other to our detriment a lot of times because, you know, it, I think that comes from a belief of, of uh, not enough to go around when to me, all you have to do is look at nature and there's plenty to go around. And, uh, and, and in life, there's opportunities. Since I kind of came out of my office in January to do new things in the world, I've just, you know, f found out that there's just more opportunity there than I'm ever going to be able to deal with. But it doesn't matter because what I'm dealing with is just plenty. And so that's really exciting. But, you know, it's, I've opened myself up to to growing and developing myself in, in ways I never expected. And I think that opportunity is there for, for women if they want to take it. Uh, when we don't self-care, uh, I think what happens is that starts depleting us, not only physically, but mentally and spiritually and emotionally. And so I think that self-care is not just a nice idea like it used to be. It's really imperative if women are going to deliver on the nurturing beings that we are, that I think that, that way of being in the world is it's not out there enough, that we need to really tune into our, our wise woman selves and be creative in the world because I think we have a lot to offer the world that's not getting, you know, we're going to have to give our own selves, in other words, permission in order to do that. It's like I've come to the conclusion that the, the knight on the white horse is, come, is not coming. And even if he was on his way, he wouldn't ask for direction. So it's just a mute point. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Oh, I can't I can see you. Um, uh, thank you for that, Deborah. And I have a, a, let me just touch on this. I know as women, oftentimes, when you're trying to take care of yourself or do what you want to do, sometimes you can feel like you're very guilty because you're not serving everybody because normally we're used to serving everybody. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, even when you try to do that, people that are used to you uh, mm -hmm. serving them, whether it's relatives, whether it's friends, are no longer going to be used to you because now you are, you just want to take care of yourself. And oftentimes you're called the B word. How 
can a woman that perhaps is trying this for the very first time, trying to take care of herself, what would you suggest would be the best way for them to do this without feeling guilty? Can you touch on it? Sure. Um, well, I think that that belief comes from fear. I think we're afraid that if we aren't serving everyone, then uh, we're, we're being selfish. I mean, I think that's a belief that we have kind of in our culture or whatever. And really, if you think about it, in order to have the energy to serve others, we need to be served first. We need to serve ourselves. And it doesn't necessarily, I think this is what's the, the concern that women have is they think it's going to take a lot of time. And I found that it doesn't take that much time. I mean, self-care for me can be, I just stop and pause and take some deep breaths and close my eyes and just center myself back to me. And that's very self-caring. It doesn't take that long. Or I get up a little extra early in the morning and I do the things that nurture me, like meditate and do yoga and those kinds of things before I begin my day. You know, so... It doesn't take that much time. And I think that's the fear that we have. And another thing, too, I, I kind of use this analogy of uh, if I have a cup of tea and you want some tea and I give some to you and then someone else comes along and they want some, pretty soon I have no tea. And then no, nobody else has any tea and they're going to go on about their business. But if I have a pot of tea, then I have tea and everyone else does too. And that's kind of how I look at, at self-care is I need to keep my pot of tea. <laughs> so I have some and everybody, I can share it with whoever else comes along. So that's again where I think that self-care for women is imperative if we're going to other care. Because that's in us to be nurturing and giving, you know, and compassionate and caring. But I think we forget we need to do that to ourselves first. Then we don't run out of the energy that we need to, do, to be of service to others. Uh, you know, I totally, I totally agree. Because um, if you are not happy, you, can give it, you cannot give what you don't have to someone else. And oftentimes, um, you, can, you can get resentful for helping mm -hmm. out when you are very tired. So I totally believe that um, we need to give ourselves time to do some self-care. Whatever it is that you consider to be your downtime, I believe it's imperative, like you said, to give it to yourself so that when you are serving, you are serving not um, from a place of hurt, but mm -hmm. from, a, from a place of being happy. So I, to I totally agree with you on that. So let's, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to add something to that. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, if we serve from, because we believe we have to, mm -hmm. that is very different to me yes. than serving from a place of love and compassion, yes. which begins with me. And that's one of the things that my journey for the last six years has taught me is my resentment came from, not from what other people were asking of me, but it came from me not getting my needs met and me not taking care of me. Because when I start taking care of me, then it's easy to freely lovingly give to others because I'm not being depleted. You know, and I had to face the fact that I had got resentful toward my husband and I had withdrawn from him a lot. And I wanted, you know, there's that first little impulse, well, I'm going to blame, blame it on him. But then I realized he hasn't asked me to do the things that I've done. That was on me. I'm the one who made that choice, and I decided that. So I needed to own that. And by owning that, then I was able to transform some things in my life. Absolutely. Because um, just what you just said about, feeling guilty because we're not doing any self-care. And I think oftentimes it's really what we put it on ourselves and nobody yep. else put it on us. But I think it goes back to um, 
should I say tradition in a sense where you are, you are expected to um, take care of uh, almost a lot of stuff. But I think people tend to forget that in those days, all you have for the most part is really home. That women didn't used to go out and work. But now when you have to work and take care of the kids and all other things that you have to do, it can be overbearing sometimes where you're doing it, uh, spiteful doing it. So yes. I totally believe that sometimes, um, really for me, spending time with other people, belonging to communities of other women, like-minded women just like yourself. Because I've always said that sometimes there's something a woman gets from another woman that even their mm. spouse cannot give you. Um, right. That's what I believe, that mm. there's something you feed off from another woman that even a spouse cannot give you. It's just that camaraderie. A woman understands another woman more than any other person. I, I can't explain it, but I strongly believe on that. I believe that uh, regardless, we need to spend time with each other, whether you belong to a community or just have a girlfriend out or whatever the case may be. So mm -hmm. I, and when you do that, you find out that your mind is more refreshed than ever. So I totally believe that. So mm -hmm. let me ask you again, um, you touch on it a little bit, and that is starting out and transitioning into where you are. What would you say for somebody listening to us now, because a lot of our audience is really matured women. I call them matured women. We are matured women. So what would you tell that person that the children are out of the house, the children are grown up, and they finish raising the children, they probably haven't worked for in a couple of years. And now they just want to do themselves. They just want to do themselves and do what they like. But with this technology, it's a little bit tough. What would you tell that person maybe watching now or watching as a replay? Okay. Um, well, be open to learning for one thing. I think a lot of times as we mature, we kind of get the idea that, well, we do have a lot of beliefs about, about maturing in that, you know, you start close, shutting yourself down. Well, I'd say, why not open yourself up and, and do some of the things, maybe kind of resurface some of the dreams that you had that you weren't able to experience, you weren't able to create because you were busy doing other things. And so if this is now your time, then get clarity about, you know, what's really important to you now, maybe a dream for learning how to paint or, you know, or learning how to play the piano. I mean, whatever that is for you is open up yourself to, you know, going down that road of learning something that maybe you hadn't been able to learn before, you know, because of your, your busyness with other things. Uh, and also, I think one of the things that I found that's very important is to just own all the parts about myself and especially my brilliance, especially my lovingness, my kindness, the way that I've nurtured people in my life that I you know, didn't give myself credit for. You know, I'm sure that a lot of people that are watching have probably done enormous things in their lives to be of service to other people, and they haven't owned that. Because to me, when you own all of who you are, that moves you forward. That opens you up to life again and to go, well, if I did that, well, what else can I do? And so, you know, it's ageless to me what we're capable of doing. Thank you. I know for myself, I totally, totally agree with what you said. Because as I venture out into this entrepreneurship, I realize the more I learn, the more I feel there's so many things I need to learn. So many things, not just need to learn, I want to learn. It's almost like I'm born again. And so I totally believe in um, learning, learning new things, meeting new people, because mm -hmm. 
Um, it opens a whole new door for you that you never probably think that you would have been able to go to before. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we continue in this conversation, can you talk about the self-care that you coach women on helping them to own their brilliance so that they can walk through the path to success and kind of tie it all together for us. Okay. Well, the three pillars of self-care is the, is the program that I've written that I use. And the first part of it is becoming self, what I call self-honest. And that relates back to owning everything in your life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, because we've survived, all of us have had difficulties in our lives, tragedies, traumas, and yet here we all are. And sometimes I've, you know, since I'm a trauma specialist and I've worked with a lot of trauma survivors, it's like we don't realize that we survived, that we did whatever we needed to do to survive because you can't thrive. You can't rock your brilliance if you don't survive first. So, you know, we all need to go, hey, we did that. Next, now what? You know, what other things, and I think this is just incredible to me, is in spite of the difficulties that we experience, at the same time, we're doing incredible things. And we haven't paid attention to those either. You know, nurturing children, taking care of people in the community, you know, whatever that service has been that a woman has done in her life, you know, I think we need to give ourselves permission to say at a girl, you know, that we, we, instead of waiting around for someone else to say it, is that we need to own that, you know, those skills that we've developed, uh, just the way that we are, uh, because we're all different, you know, and similar and different in a lot of ways. And we have our own unique talents, like you said earlier, and skills and why not just take ownership of those it doesn't mean that you have to stay stuck in that you can still grow and develop but i think that you know to me being real to, so to me being self-honest is not just about looking at the things that i'm afraid to look at you know because i think they might be bad or terrible but it's about looking at all the good things in me as well because those are going to really uh nurture nurture us forward and then uh, out of being self-honest, then it's about getting into alignment with that. You know, so what are my values? What's important? What's really important to me? You know, gaining clarity about that. And it is a process to do this. I call it the pause process because in a way you've got to pause a little bit, you know, consistently in order to come to these, these awarenesses. And, uh, I had an experience um, with a, a case that I had that really helped me connect to the, the values that I have that I'd been living and didn't even realize it. It was a very, very difficult year experience uh, with a court case that I was involved in. And uh, it didn't quite come out. You know, it's like I didn't get the outcome I thought that should be there. And so, in a, so it, I felt like I had failed this child because things didn't go like I had wanted them to. And it really shook me up. And in that shaking up, I realized, um, wait a minute, what, what is really important to me about what I'm doing? And I really took a deep look at that and realized that the value of, of what I bring to what I do was there, that I did do the best I, that I could. And I did, I was living consistently with the values that I had, but I wasn't in total control of that situation. So that in turn helped me to begin to redefine what success was for me because we get so focused on the result and the outcome that we miss a lot of other things. And in doing, and that's what exactly I had done to the point, well, I was just about ready to even quit counsel, being a counselor. So that's, you know, what a devastating experience that was for me. But out of it came 
a renewed clarity for me about what my values are and what's really important to me. And I decided to redefine success, not by whether I won or lost, but am I living consistently with my values and my integrity? And that was a big awakening. So I find that that's some of the work I do with women too, is really help identify those values because it's not something we like sit around and talk about, <laughs> you know, is what are our values? You know, how do you identify those? I mean, uh, that's what I had to do is identify what was really important to me. And so then out of that self alignment, then the next part of the three pillars of self care is heartful communication because the more aligned I am and the more connected I am to what I call my own soulfulness and my own humanness, it's connecting to both of them and not making, especially not making my humanness wrong, but recognizing that given everything in my life, I could not have done anything differently than what I did until now. And now I can change it. And now I can transform things by my new choices. And so then that's where it comes in, heartfully connect, uh, communicating to other people in a gentle, loving, kind way, your new place in your life wh where you see yourself. And that's what I did with my husband. And I was a little scared about it because, you know, I had shut down so much. I, wasn't al I hadn't allowed myself to really be heartfully vulnerable, to really share with him what was on my heart and what I was struggling with and what my challenges were. And as I began to do that, it was like he shifted. It was really interesting to watch. It was like out of my shift, he shifted. And he started opening up and mm -hmm. things have become, you know, just very different for us. And we've been married like 36 years. So who would think wow. that anything could change? <laughs> but I realized that it's because I opened myself up and I was being honest with him where in reality, I realized I wasn't being honest with him before because I was hiding so much, but then I was hiding it for myself too. So I had to get it open up to myself and get clear with myself about things. And so those are the three pillars that we work through in my coaching. That was practice. so good. Can you, one more time, that was so good. Just in case there's somebody out there writing all of this down, and I know some of our audience are writing it down, say one more time, the three pillars of self-care. Self-honesty, self-alignment, and heartful communication. Thank you very much. I enjoy it. Then you talk about you and your husband. So let me ask you this. Do you think it's, um, you're probably not the only one. Do you think that um, oftentimes it's not really about your husband. It's you specifically because you feel, or we feel oftentimes that perhaps the other person would not understand. Or again, it go back to guilt, right? But mm -hmm. in actuality, um, perhaps the other person didn't get what it is that we want from them. Is that, is that am I saying kind of the right thing? Uh, yeah, we, well, I think we all have expectations of each other. But we forget to include the other person in, you know, asking them, you know, can you meet this expectation? We just kind of assume they should because, you know, I think... I don't know, it just seems like once you get married, you start having assumptions about the other person instead of really having clear, heartful communication with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I realized that it was really about me making the shift and being more open and honest and probably more easier to get along with. <laughs> 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 that probably made him be able to move a little bit forward to, toward me because I think I, I think women scare men. Mm, you think so? I do. I think, yes, I think the bitch in us scares men. Yes. Then they don't know okay. how to deal with it. That gives me another topic to talk about. <laughs> that will be on another conversation. I will have to bring you back or someone else to talk about that because, uh -huh. um, 
you know, we've read the book. I don't know whether you've read the book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are yeah. From Venus. Men Are From yeah. Venus, right? And we're all supposed to live on. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's a lot of learning to women, that's for sure. So um as we come well, to the one goal, of the things that I go ahead. Okay, one of the things I talk about too is that we go, we fluctuate, I think as women we fluctuate between the good girl and the bitch, and neither one of them get us what we need. So we have to come <laughs> to a new way. And that's what I, t I talk about. Okay. That why well, we'll have to table that for, and um, that's really a good topic to talk about. I may have to schedule that for another, um, another conversation. As we okay. come to the close, I want to ask you, if you look back in your 20 old you, 20 old mm -hmm. self you, and mm -hmm. the person that you are today, what would you give that person perhaps that is still young or that is still matured? what would you say to them to live more fulfilling life? I say, listen to your intuitive intelligence and you'll, mm. you'll do just fine. I love that. Intuitive intelligence. That's, 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 I love that. So, yeah, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> that's a whole new conversation that I'm sure you'll come back and visit us next time. So this is, uh, I thank you so much. I appreciate you. And thanks for taking the time to join me today. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording now and the audience can ask questions. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording. Okay.